Well, good afternoon. I am so grateful that you are here, that you have taken time out of a Friday afternoon to come and to be with us all around the world. We have people joining us from Edinburgh, Scotland, to Canada, to Wisconsin, uh, from Colorado, New Jersey, and here in Florida, in Longwood, Florida, all to remember this day together as the church. And it's a significant day for us to remember, and it's significant for many, many reasons, but just a couple. The first is this, that it gives you your identity. This day gives you your identity. It gives us our identity together as the church. It's also a significant day because today is a day of substitution. You're going to be hearing more about that, but it's, it's, it's important for us to remember that that God made a way for us to be with him again. And we want to remember that. All throughout the season of Lent, if you have been with us, you know we have been focusing on the fact that Christ is the author of redemption. And we see this all throughout Scripture from the very beginning. And I think it's good just to remember the beginning of the story that Adam and Eve fell away from God. They disobeyed and they fell away from that relationship. But in that moment, God asked them, where are you? And it wasn't a geography question. It was a relationship question. It's a good question for you to consider this afternoon, for me to consider, where are you? And then God quickly finds a substitution, makes a sacrifice, and he covers Adam and Eve. He covers their shame and their guilt. And this is the story all throughout Scripture that we see again and again, that there are substitutions, there are sacrifices. But the problem with all of them is none of them have the power to change. They don't have the power to change you or change me until Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus of Nazareth, arrived on the scene 2,000 years ago, and he made a way. He was the substitution. It's what scripture says. The apostle Paul says that he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might be made righteous before God. We might be the righteousness of God. Christ was forsaken upon a cross so that we won't ever be forsaken, no matter what kind of cross you might be carrying this afternoon. And Christ made a way for us to come and to be with God, to know the joy that he offers us. And so we want to remember what he has done in this time. And the way that we do this is remembering the seven last statements of Christ upon the cross. And over the course of these next few moments, as you hear these statements read from Scripture, the lights will get darker and darker. And there will be a deep darkness for a time. And kids, I want to just let you know it's okay. We planned it this way. You can just squeeze your mom or dad's arm a little harder if you're scared, but no need to be scared. The reason that it gets darker is to help draw our attention further in to what God has done for us, to remove the distractions, to lay those to the side. I know there are a lot of distractions on a Friday afternoon at 12 o'clock. And I want to invite you to lay those to the side and to consider what God has done for you, and to also offer up your brokenness to him. Offer up your sin before him as we do this. I love the way one poet and writer puts it, and I think this helps uh, uh, focus our time together. Perhaps we must accept our brokenness and not try to repress it before we can affirm the goodness of Good Friday and all that it promises. We are all broken, we human creatures, and, we, and to pretend we're not is to inhibit healing. It is people who consider themselves whole who tell me that the Christian promises are false. But as I look at these whole people, I see that they are in fact less whole than some who admit their brokenness. And so that's why we're here, to come before him, to offer ourselves to him, and to ultimately encounter the hope of Good Friday. Pastor John's going to be teaching us about that in just a minute. But we want to worship him together. And we're going to begin our time with a responsive call to worship that comes from Isaiah. Would you please stand? I'll begin and we'll respond together. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We gather here to worship God. We gather to remember how Jesus suffered and died for us and to thank God for his love and his mercy. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before God like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. 
He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like, like one, one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole, and with his stripes we are healed. Let us pray responsively. Merciful God, as we remember how your Son, Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the cross, how seven times he spoke seven words of love, we ask you to bless our hearing. 
Father, as we recall how all three hours his silence cried for mercy on the souls of all, we ask you to help us to understand the mystery of your love and make us into a people who are ever more worthy of it. Amen. You may be seated. The first statement, Luke 23, 33 through 35. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself, if he is Christ of God, the chosen one. Lord Jesus, you gave your life for us. You, you suffered and died that, that we might be made whole. The second statement, Luke 23, 39 through 43. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly for what we are getting, what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be w with me in paradise. Lord Jesus, you gave your life for us. You, you suffered, suffered and, and died, died that, that we, we might be made whole. Let's stand together and worship.
You may be seated. The third statement, John 19, 25 through 27. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Lord Jesus, you gave your life for us. You, you suffered, suffered and died that, that we might be made whole. Matthew 27, 46. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You gave your life for us. You suffered and died that we might be made whole. Let's stand again and worship.
You may be seated. The fifth statement, John 19, 28. Later, knowing that all was now completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. Lord Jesus, you gave your life for us. You, you suffered, suffered and died that, that we might be made whole. The sixth statement, John 19, 29 through 30. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Lord Jesus, you gave your life for us. You suffered, suffered and died that, that we, we might, might be made whole. The seventh statement, Luke 23, 44 through 46. It was now about the sixth hour and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour for the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands and commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Lord Jesus, you gave your life for us. You we suffered, suffered and, and died, died that we might, might be made whole. Would you stand and let's proclaim together what we believe in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy apostolic church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. You know, as a church family, we've been learning about what it is to be rooted and to be established in our faith. We've been learning about first principles, those things that Jesus taught and was passed on to the apostles, uh, things that were important for us to know. And this morning as we gather, we're thinking and we're talking about one of the most fundamental and central things that we must know and believe about Jesus Christ and that is his substitutionary death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So it is good that we have gathered on Good Friday to remember and to reflect on the substitutionary work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. You've listened to some of these statements and these scenes that happened uh, those final hours before Jesus died on the cross for us. And I'd like for us to take the rest of this time and focus on one of those scenes 
one of those sayings and that of the, the criminals who were dying on either side of Jesus Christ. I'd like to reread that passage for us again. It's found in Luke 23. I begin reading in verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they were crucified with him. Along with the criminals, one on the right and one on the left, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They divided up his clothes by casting lots, and the people stood watching. The rulers even sneered at him, and they said, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the Chosen One. And the soldiers also came, and they mocked him, and they offered him wine vinegar, and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Do not you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth today you will be with me in paradise. Well, several observations about this particular scene. The first observation is this, that what we see before us are two men that have been convicted and are suffering the consequences for their deeds. They're paying the price. In fact, one turns, one says, you know, <laughs> save us. And the other one goes, wait a minute, we're punished justly for we are getting what we deserved. Now, their story is our story, right? It really is when you think about it. We have sinned, and there are consequences to our sin. I think of the, the book of Romans where Paul writes this letter to the Romans, and I picture the first three chapters like a courtroom scene. And Paul uh, is the prosecuting attorney and, and we, mankind, are the ones that are standing trial. So Paul opens up the case and he starts bringing forth the evidence. Um, and the first thing he starts off with is that we are accountable to the Creator. In fact, there's plenty of evidence to show that there is a Creator and we're responsible to Him. And Paul says, the invisible things of God are clearly seen by the things that are made so that we are without an excuse. But what did we do? We just pushed that aside and we worshiped the creature, the created things rather than the creator. We decided we're going to do life on our own. We can handle this. We don't need God. And Paul says in that first chapter that as this goes on and on and on, he says the wrath of God is being continually revealed from heaven. Because sin has consequences. Well, then he turns to those that might be looking down their noses at, quote unquote, the sinners, the more religious group uh, in chapter two. And he says, oh, by the way, you that are judging them, don't you know that you're doing the very same thing? And he goes on to talk in, in chapter two and begins to target particularly the religious Jews and say, you know, you've got the law and the prophets, and yet your hearts are stubborn you're unrepentant, and what you're actually doing is storing up wrath. So in chapter three, he begins to wrap things up and he formulates some closing statements in this courtroom scene. And here are his closing statements. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away, they have together become worthless. There was no one who does good, not even one. And it's as though the judge lowers the gavel onto the desk and says, guilty, the wages of sin is death. That's bad news. That's really bad news. And you know, I don't know that we can appreciate good news until we know the bad news. But imagine this, just use your imagination for a second. Imagine that you were standing trial for first degree murder, okay? No, you wouldn't murder anybody, but just, just imagine for a moment. 
The trial takes place, the evidence is all presented, the jury makes their decision, and the judge reaches, re reads the verdict. The verdict is read, guilty of first degree murder, sentence to death by lethal injection. And your heart just sinks. The, the law enforcement people come and they cuff you. You look over to the side and you see your family and you're just filled with dread. And you're beginning to get ushered out of the courtroom and at that moment, the judge says, wait, stop, stop, stop. I got my son here today. He's got a clean record. And he said he'll take your place. And they come and they take the, the handcuffs off you and you're free. Well, that's, a, that's what substitutionary death is. The substitutionary death of Jesus Christ is throughout the narrative of Scripture. We see it pictured many times throughout the story of Scripture. Think back to the garden, right? Remember Adam and Eve sinned? God warned them, if you, if you eat of this fruit, you will die. Guess what? Sin had consequences. They died. They were separated from God. They were separated from each other. And eventually they died physically. But do you remember what happened? when they tried to cover themselves up in their shame, what happened? God covered them with skins of an animal. Well, the assumption is that the animal was killed, its blood was shed, and they were covered. And so we have very, at the very, very early stages of Scripture, a picture of the substitutionary death of Jesus. Fast forward, Abraham and Isaac, you know that story. Abraham gets this long-awaited son, and, and God asks him to go up to Mount Moriah and offer his son as a sacrifice. Abraham obeys and gets the wood, and they head up the mountain, puts the wood on the altar, lays his son on the altar, is about to plunge a knife right into his son, and at the last minute, God says, oh, stop, stop. There's a lamb caught in the thicket. Take that lamb and offer it as a sacrifice. Move a little bit forward. You know, there's something called the Passover. Some of you celebrated a, a Seder dinner last night, which commemorates this, this part of Jewish history where the angel of death was going to come and kill all the firstborn in Egypt. And God had instructed the Jews to take a lamb for their household, kill that lamb, and put the blood upon the lintel and the doorposts. And when the angel of death came over, their firstborns would be spared. Once a year, they were to have what was called the Day of Atonement. And the Day of the Atonement, the high priest was to take a bull and shed its blood and take its blood and put it on the horns of the altar and go into the tabernacle and put it on the mercy seat. So over and over again, we have these pictures of the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. Well, not only is it pictured, but it is also prophesied. The prophecy is by Isaiah 53. We saw some of those verses. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. But I'd like to remind you of something, folks. This truth of the substitutionary death of Jesus has come under fire in our day. Some are beginning to say that, you know... You know, it sounds like cosmic child abuse that, you know, what father would stand by and let his son die? You know, some are saying that, you know, this whole thing of judgment and wrath, you know, it's kind of a medieval thing, and, it, and all that does is foster violence. What we really should just be talking about is love and forgiveness and mercy. Well, you know, the other day I was going down I-4, and uh, I saw, you've probably seen this. Yeah, it's a big old billboard on I-4. It says, God is not angry. When I read that, I go on, 
okay, I get that. I, you know, I, go, I know that God's not mad at me. You know, he's forgiven me. But, but just to make a blanket statement that there's no such thing as judgment or wrath or God being angry, I got to tell you, I think that's wrong. I think that's wrong. You know, mercy and justice kiss each other. You got to have both. You know, Jesus' death on the cross wasn't just a, an example of living a sacrificial life. It was that. But Jesus Christ's death was a substitution for our sin so that we wouldn't have to pay for it. I love this song. It's an old hymn, Man of Sorrows, What a Name for the Son of God Who Came. Ruined sinner to reclaim, bearing shame and scoffy rude, scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood, guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless Lamb of God was he, full atonement can it be, hallelujah, what a Savior. The substitutionary death of Jesus was taking place in between these two criminals. It was first proclaimed by John the Baptist when he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And after the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, it became what the apostles proclaimed. Paul said, While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Peter said he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. And the apostle John, this apostle of love, said, here's how we really understand love, that Jesus Christ died for our sins. Well, one of the criminals on the cross turned to Jesus, right? Turned to Jesus and said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And you remember and you heard what Jesus' response was. Here's a man that says, you know what? I get it. I, I deserve this. My bad. I'm wrong. But he turns to Jesus and said, remember me. And Jesus says these amazing words. Today, you will be with me in paradise. That's the hope of Good Friday. That's the hope we cling to. The assurance and anticipation because of the death of Jesus Christ, that we have eternal life in heaven with him. You know, 90 times in the book of John, over 90 times, John says something as simple as this, those who believe in him have everlasting life. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you have that same hope. You have the same assurance and live with the anticipation that when you leave this life, heaven will be your home. But hope is an important thing, isn't it? You know, what is hope? It's the anticipation of what's coming. If we don't have hope, it's like running a race without a finish line. That can be frustrating. You know, the truth of the matter is, folks, we live in Saturday, don't we? We live in between Friday and Easter Sunday. If you haven't noticed, we're not home yet. And some of you are really believing that and you're living, you know, it's hard. And some of you are probably really struggling and you're feeling what it's like to still live in this world where there's pain and there's loss and disappointment. You've been sinned against and you've sinned against others and you're living with that. But for us, the hope of Good Friday produces something. It produces endurance. Jesus, while he was on the cross, he fixed his eyes on the joy that was before him. That helped him endure the cross. Even Paul, when he was suffering, and boy, did he suffer. He said, compared to the eternal weight of glory that I'm anticipating, this suffering seems moment, just momentary and light compared to what I'm looking forward to. So hope in the Bible is always about our home in heaven. It's not about, you know, tomorrow it's not going to rain. Sometimes we pray about those things or, or bad things are going to go away. 
Hope biblically is the anchor of our soul and it's the assurance and anticipation that heaven is our home. Um, a couple of months ago, one of our church members, our, our family here, um, went home to be with Jesus. Um, she was a friend of mine. Her name was Linda Beatty. Uh, we were classmates together at, at RTS and we were the same age, so we had kids, so we had lots of conversations about life and about scripture and about counseling and those kinds of things. And, and I was shocked about right around Christmas time, I got a, an email from her husband, Doug. And Doug said, um, Linda's really sick, she's got cancer. Uh, can you come and, and, and see her? She's, she's asking for you. So I go over and uh, we were kind of catching up. I was pretty shocked to, to even hear that she was sick. I didn't know it. And so we, for the next uh, couple of months, we would come over from time to time, spend some time with her and her family. And it was really hard for Linda. Not only the physical pain, but she had a great husband, two wonderful boys, a mother, a sister, a great family. It was really, really, really hard for her to accept the fact that she would be leaving. Can you imagine, right? Can you only imagine? And she turned to me one day, she said, John, I'm scared. I'm scared. I can understand that. And although we read the scriptures to her, you know, she, there's still this sense of, I'm scared. Well, several days before she died, she went into a semi-conscious um, state, she was unable to speak anymore. She couldn't talk. And then about 24 hours before she died, her husband Doug and the hospice nurse were in the room with her. And they heard her say as clear as can be the word beautiful. Beautiful. And we cannot help but believe what Linda saw was heaven opening and being invited to come home. That's the hope we're talking about here. So I wanna ask you all, what side of the cross are you on? Are you on the side of the cross that has turned to Jesus and said, look, I, I deserve what's coming. Um, show me mercy, please forgive me for my sins. If you have done that, guess what? We have the assurance of heaven. You have the assurance that when you press your dying pillow, you will wake up in the presence of Jesus Christ. Boy, and that helps us a lot in enduring hard stuff. Well, maybe, you're, maybe you haven't turned there yet, and you're on the other side. You're, you're saying, you know, I'm just going to take my chances. Can I, can I just say, don't do that. I urge you, that's not a good idea. You know, we're familiar with John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that ever, whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you know what first, uh, John 3, 18 says? He that believes in Christ on the son is not condemned. But he who does not believe in the son is condemned already. Don't take that chance. If you're here or you're online, Jesus paid for your sin. He paid the sin debt. Turn to him. And you too will have the assurance of eternal life and a hope in heaven. Well, maybe you guys are going through a hard time and you, it's hard for you to see a better day coming, okay? I mean, you're in the midst of some financial issue, relational problems. Maybe you're, you got cancer and you're struggling. Fix your eyes on Jesus who endured the cross. Fix your eyes on the hope that someday you will be home. You know, one day, all of us are gonna gather as a family we will stand before God. And you know what we're gonna fix our eyes on? We will fix our eyes 
on the nail scars that are in his hand and his feet and his side. We will be drawn to that substitutionary death that he paid for us. And we will join the chorus of heaven singing, worthy is the lamb that was slain. We will sing to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb. All praise, and honor, and glory, and power forever and ever. Folks, that'll be beautiful. That'll be beautiful. Until then, because we're not home yet, we're reminded what Paul told us in Romans chapter 12. We studied this a few weeks ago. In light of the mercies of God, offer up our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our spiritual act of worship. So we worship now by giving him our life because he gave his life for us. Would you pray with me? Father, it's hard to take this in. It's hard to take it in that you would die for us, that you would give us your life. Father, we pray that you would Help us grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Jesus Christ. We ask you to help us with that. And Father, we also, also would ask you to enlighten our, the eyes of our heart so that we could see the hope of our calling, so that we could have a glimpse of heaven, so that we would know that we are going to live eternity in eternity with you. And Father, that we would give our lives until then to honor and to glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, like any other man Held beneath a mother's loving gaze Somewhere between now and then I lost the man I could have been Took everything that wasn't mine to take That it is not too late Only one of us deserves this cross A suffering that should belong to me Deep within this man I hang beside place where shame and grace collide and it's beautiful agony and he believes it's not too late for me and this is how love wins every single time climbing high upon a tree where someone else should die And this is how love heals The deepest part of you Letting himself bleed into The middle of your wounds This is what love says Standing at the door You don't have to be Who you've been before Silenced by his voice, death can't speak again. This is how love wins. 
did you see this moment from the start that we would drink this cup of suffering I wonder did we ever meet childhood games in dusty streets all my many sorrows and regrets nothing could compare to just this one that in the presence of my king I cannot fall upon my knees I cannot carry you up to your throne you instead will carry How love wins every single time Climbing high upon a tree Where someone else should die and This is how love heals The deepest part of you Letting himself bleed into The middle of your wounds and This is what love says you don't have to be who you've been before Silenced by his voice Death can't speak again This is how love can wash away my sin Nothing but blood Nothing but blood What can make me whole again Nothing but blood Nothing but the blood This is what love says Standing at This is how love wins. Would you stand and pray with me? Lord Jesus, we stand here amazed again of the story of what you have done on our behalf, that by your wounds you have healed us. You are in the process of healing us. And so we ask that you would continue today and the weeks ahead keep our eyes fixed upon you. And so together, all of us in all of these places now offer up this prayer of dedication. Church, would you pray responsively with me? Lord God, you have given us everything. You have not held anything back. Help us in like manner to give of ourselves. Sanctify us in Christ's name. Bless us in all that we think, feel, say, and do that we, like Jesus, may be a blessing unto others. We ask this in all things that we ask of you through him, saying the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. We'll come back this weekend for the rest of the story. Go in the power of Christ.